Good morning. I'm Tang Kiwi, and welcome to WISE WCA's first online lecture. Let me get the share screen together, and then we shall begin. Okay. The world we live in is a lovely world, but in the past few months, unfortunately, uh, we've been ravaged by a virus. But the world has actually been quite sick for a few years, even before COVID-19 appeared. And if we go back 10 years, you know, there was the subprime crisis of 2008, 2009. That weakened the global economy to a large extent. But despite that, it was propped up, supported by three legs. One of them is there was still trade among nations. There was generally good health and prices of commodities were more or less stable. But one by one, all the legs started to break off. The first leg broke off probably two years ago in January 2018, when the US started a trade war with China. The second leg broke off a few months ago, last December in fact, when the coronavirus appeared. And a month ago, the third leg broke when Saudi Arabia and Russia waged war an oil price war. So we are today lost at sea with lightning striking away, dark clouds covering the horizon, and we are caught in the stormy sea. In the next 45 minutes, I'm going to tell you how we got ourselves into this situation and hopefully how we can get out of this situation. But before I proceed another slide, please read this. In any healthy economy, there must be balance, balance between demand and supply. Sometimes if one is out of whack, then the world will find itself in a difficult situation. In 1973, there was a supply shock event. That was when, if those of you can recall, uh, the OPEC countries decided to cut off their petrol supplies to the West. And that uh, resulted in an oil crisis in 1973. In the 1970s, the world's cars were very inefficient, gas gases rather and uh, heating in homes and buildings were also inefficient. And so when the OPEC countries started to cut back on the supply of petrol to the world, there was a supply shock event because suddenly people couldn't get enough petrol and all the factories couldn't get enough petrol to fuel their machines. A few months ago, a similar supply shock event happened and that was when the coronavirus appeared in Wuhan. As you recall, China tried to counteract this threat by shutting down and quarantine a lot of cities. So this is a photo of a Wuhan railway station. Uh, what happened was that not only were residents forced to remain indoors like a lockdown, but factories were also shut because workers could not go to their factories. And so for a while, China couldn't produce. As you know, China is the world's manufacturer and supplier of goods. But the investor, investment world and businesses outside China, at first they were not worried. They were not worried because they felt that there were other alternatives. Vietnam, Cambodia, Mexico, these were countries that could, or so they thought, supply a lot of goods that China was supplying as well. So the market was actually uh, shrugged off what happened in China. But slowly, as we learn, as the disease or the virus spread all over the world, one by one, countries outside China began to tumble. 
The first one was uh, Italy. And of course, the, this is a big photograph of Milan, and it was hardest hit. As the virus spread and more and more people fell ill, suddenly people thought twice about going out to eat, thought twice about getting on board a plane, on board a ship, and so spending started to fall. And this, what we have now is not only a uh, supply shock, which was started by the virus, but a demand shock because people decided that it's a bit dangerous to gather together and spend money. So what we have now is a supply shock and a demand shock. And then the third leg broke. This one I told you was a month ago when uh, Saudi Arabia and Russia wage war with each other, a price war. In response, the price of oil plunged from 60 over dollars right down to above 30. And this was only within the first week. Uh, it subsequently fell lower to $20, and today it's up to about $27. The impact on global stock markets was also swift and severe. This is a chart of the S&P 500, and see how it fell from three, over 3,000 points all the way down to 2,005. Of course, we know that it went lower, but now today it's about back to about 2,005 again. The question is, how did, why did this oil war, war start? Well, we have to look at OPEC. OPEC for, was for many years the main supplier of oil, one third in fact. And for many years, they controlled uh, oil prices, supply of oil. But over the past 20 years, more and more oil producers appeared. And they began to eat into OPEC share and they also uh, uh, competed with OPEC. And in the past two years, when US and China were in a trade war, the price of oil uh, weakened. OPEC felt that they couldn't uh, keep the price up because there were too many other suppliers. So around 2017, Russia and a few other countries uh, joined OPEC and this new consortium or this group is, we call them OPEC Plus. So as you can see in this graph, the dark blue parts are the old OPEC members. The light blue parts are the new uh, OPEC members. Well, they're not really OPEC members, but we call together, we call them OPEC Plus. What they did when they got together? Well, in early 2019, they decided to restrict output by 2.1 million barrels a day. This agreement was supposed to expire in March this year. In March this year, because of the coronavirus in China, they wanted to cut another 1.5 million barrels from the market. But this time, Russia refused. Russia refused because Russia's logic is this. Why should I be cutting back on oil when the US shale oil producers uh, are not participating in these cutbacks. Is other Russians justified? Actually, yes, if you look at the charts, um, the US shale oil came into the market around 2013, 2014. And since then, they've been great uh, producers of oil all over to fall the market all over the world. Looking at the table, the U.S. is today producing almost as much as Saudi Arabia and Russia. So, of course, Russia is justified in arguing that why should we bear the burden of further oil cutbacks when the U.S. oil producers are not involved in this agreement? Well, basically, Russia doesn't want to lose market share. So, so this war started between Saudi Arabia and Russia. A lot of people think that it's just a war between Russia and Saudi Arabia. But uh, the truth is, it's not really. It's actually a trade war between USA and Russia. Why do I say that? Well, if you look back, okay, the Russians have always been supplying gas 
to the European markets to Germany. In 2011, they built this gas pipeline called the Nord Stream 1 between to supply gas from Russia all the way to Germany. Now, around 2018, 2019, uh, the demand was there for the Russians to want to build another gas pipeline. So this is the Nord Stream 2. But uh, the Americans sabotaged it and told European companies and countries not to buy gas from Russia. So the Russians felt very unhappy when the Americans tried to eat into their earnings. From the Russian point of view, the American friendship with Saudi Arabia can go back a long way. Okay, this is Reagan and the former uh, Saudi Arabian king. And the Russians remember that way back in those days, remember there was this Cold War between 1945 and 1991, whereby they were both involved in an arms race and a space race. All this cost money and the Russians paid it through their oil earnings. Around 1985, Saudi Arabia was persuaded by the Americans to cut the price of oil from $30 to about $15 because Saudi Arabia could do that because they were basically the monopoly. What happened was gold, global oil prices fell from 30 to 15. So it hurt Russian oil producers because before they could sell at $30 and now they could only sell at $15. So Russia, uh, USSR, the earnings of USSR then had fallen by almost half. And this was, this had a major impact on the, the survival of USSR. So much so that within four to five years, the USSR also didn't have the money to support its satellite countries anymore. So when East Berlin wanted to break off from USSR, uh, Moscow just couldn't do anything to stop it. It was the beginning of the fall of the Berlin Wall and of course the USSR, because within two years, in 1991, the USSR collapsed. The Russians remember this, and when they see the relationship of Mohammed bin Salman and Trump, who are best friends forever, and how Trump uh, managed to protect MBS from a public murder, uh, the Russians felt that uh, there must be something behind the Saudi Arabian uh, uh, proposal to cut uh, oil production again in March this year. So anyway, the oil price war has started. So the question is, who will win this oil price war? Well, we have to look at the prices and the costs of uh, coming out with oil. There are three parties involved in this oil war, Russia, Saudi Arabia, and US shale oil producers. Let's look at Russia and Saudi Arabia first. For Saudi Arabia, it's very cheap to take out oil. It's almost $3 a barrel. For the Russians, $7. For US shale oil, it's between 30 to 60. And for the Canadian tar sands, it's a bit higher, 40 to 80. Now, although oil is, can be gotten out cheap by Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia had a lot of obligations. The Saudi Arabian government is very generous with welfare. They give everyone lots of money every month uh, to have a good life. And so they, over the years, they have racked up quite a huge budget deficit, the government of Saudi Arabia. So if you take account all these welfare payments they give to their citizens, the cost for the Saudi Arabian is not $3, but it's actually $84 a barrel. Russia also has its own obligations. And so the cost, basically cost of taking out oil for Russians is 42. So at today's price, today is about $27 a barrel. Definitely Saudi Arabia, Russia, US, and everyone is suffering from the lower uh, oil price. So now let's look at the reserves of 
Saudi Arabia and Russia because it's how much money you have in the bank that will probably indicate how long they can survive in this oil price war. Both have about the same amount of reserves, about $500 billion. Okay. Russia is in actually a better position because about five, six years ago, it was, uh, and sanctions were imposed by the US and the Russian international reserves fell. But since 2015, the Russians have been able to accumulate their reserves back to $500 billion. So this oil price war between Russia and Saudi Arabia could be a repeat of the standoff between Russia and Saudi Arabia in the World Cup in 2018. Those who football fans will know what was the outcome. Well, the score then was five to Russia and zero to Saudi Arabia. And I think this is going to be the case because I think the Russians are able to withstand the price war better than Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia's commitments are huge. Let's look back at the trade war between USA and Russia. Russia has an advantage. And the advantage is that its cost of production is far lower. For the US shale oil producers, they, uh, it costs them about $30 to $60 to produce a barrel of oil. And over the years, they have indebted themselves to the tune of $200 billion, okay? Uh, is $200 billion a lot of money? Yes, it is, of course. But let's compare it to the Great Recession of 2008. At that time, the subprime loans, the number was three times bigger than 207, about 600 billion. So I suppose even with all the US oil uh, producers uh, go bankrupt, the punishment to the US economy isn't as great as in the Great Recession of 2008. And I suppose, I believe that when uh, Russia started this fight with USA, it had no intentions of bringing down the US economy. In fact, it couldn't. Maybe it was just trying to bring down the US shale oil industry, who are actually indebted up to about $200 billion. But of course we know something which no one knew then, and that was the coronavirus. Around 8, 13 of, 12 of March, the number of uh, coronavirus uh, patients in the US was 1,000. Here it is, 1,000. Of course, Iran and Italy, they were way above. So it wasn't a concern. The virus wasn't a concern for the US economy. Today, the number of cases of COVID-19 in the US has um, ballooned from 1,000 to 300 and over 1,000. What this means? Well, this is, um, well, you could say that it's the fault of CDC. They didn't come, they didn't come out with an effective testing machine uh, to, to detect um, those suffering from uh, the virus. And of course, our friend uh, Trump didn't help much. He was trying to deny the existence of this uh, pandemic for a long time. And he was repeatedly uh, saying things that were not really scientific. In fact, contradicting his scientific advices. You know, I think that these two persons, Trump and Greta, they both should go back to school together and learn something. They should not be given the platform to speak. Well, as it is now, we know that the coronavirus has uh, grown rapidly in the US and in the next few weeks, it's supposed to hit its peak damage. What have central banks done in the past few weeks to try to control this disaster? Well, they have basically done what they did in 2008, which is to cut interest rates. But actually, they run out of ammunition. Because if you look at the chart, this is of the US Federal Reserve. 
okay? In 2008, it cut interest rates from 5% all the way to down to zero. And in the recent scare, it's cut down to just above 0%. So basically, there isn't much more they can do. And what applies to the US Fed, applies to European banks, the British banks, and most central banks of the world. There isn't, no, there isn't much they can do now. Governments have also tried to uh, introduce relief plans, stimulus plans. And of course, uh, Trump uh, last week managed to get together $2 trillion to help the US economy. Is $2 trillion enough? Apparently, no, not really. Because the US economy today is about $21 trillion. So $2 trillion is only uh, 10%. It is not enough to revive the US economy. Many parts of the US economy are badly affected. Nobody is traveling in planes. Nobody is going to restaurants to eat. No one is going to Disneyland. And the streets of New York are empty. So compared to 2008, the impact of this virus is far worse. The subprime crisis, if can be equated to a fire in a dustbin, today's virus pandemic, the damage is equivalent to a forest fire. How did we get into this mess? Because the whole world is heavily indebted. And why is it heavily indebted? The culprit is low interest rates over the past 10 over years. You can see US, bank, US firms have borrowed three times more than they did in 2008. In 2008, they borrowed about $2 trillion. Uh, two years ago, they have borrowed up to $6 trillion, so three times more. Why? Because interest rates were too low. And what we have today are a lot of zombie companies. Companies that are not making enough money or making enough money just to cover their interest rates or maybe not at all. On top of that, there are other loans to contend with. The blue line is the uh, student loans. And you can see in the past uh, 15 years, it has gone up a lot to up to $1.46 trillion. Auto loans are also up, this is the dark gray lines, up to $1.27 trillion. Credit card loans are more or less stable compared to 2008. And what's happening in the US is also happening all over the world. This chart shows the loan obligations of Chinese consumers in the past 10 years or so. See, GDP of China has gone up, but the amount of loans that consumers have uh, racked up over the past 10 years has opened balloon as well. Banks are also borrowing lots of money, or they did. And look at all the top banks. This uh, chart shows their total assets and the amount of money or the amount they have used to leverage up on their bets on derivatives. Look at JP Morgan. Its total assets is about under $3 trillion, but it has uh, taken a bet of $63 trillion. Basically, what has happened in the world is that we are seeing lots and lots of bubbles everywhere. Bubbles in real estate, bubbles in derivative market, bubbles everywhere. This chart shows the, uh, the, uh, all the different bubbles. This is the derivative market, $530 trillion. The global real estate market, about $200 trillion. Global debt is almost $200 trillion. Okay? And uh, fiscal money is $43 trillion. Stock markets of the world, $77 trillion. How big is $532 trillion? Well, the best way is to look at the size of the U.S. economy. And the size of the U.S. economy is only about $22 trillion. So we, the world has borrowed so much 
multiple times of the GDP of US economy. And that's dangerous. It's dangerous because with the stock market coming down 20, 30% in the past month, we don't really know who has been hurt. We don't really know the extent of the damage. Okay, it's just like the iceberg that we see or the ship see. What we see is only the top part. The damage or the bulk of the problems could be below the sea level. And so we don't really know how many companies are actually badly affected now. It'll come out in the next few months. It's the same with the COVID-19. Initially, when it first came out, we thought that, oh, uh, it's not Trump's transmissible, that uh, it will die immediately. But as we learn more and more, we realize that this virus actually sticks around for many, many hours on plastic and metal surfaces. So as we learn more, it becomes the threat becomes more dangerous. And of course, we also learn that uh, those who are suffering from pre-existing illnesses, if they get the uh, virus, their chances of them dying are higher. So it's the same in the financial markets. There are many com companies that have pre-existing illnesses. Well, things like uh, they are over indebted, they're not profitable. So if this current plunge in the stock market will actually hit them much worse, we will, it only takes time before we find out who they are and how badly hit they are. Which means to say, I think that in the next few months, the S&P 500 will fall further as more of this bad news emerge. Even if the price of price oil price war stop tomorrow, it's not going to help us. Why? Because the global economy is not going to recover. London will remain deserted or nobody wants to go out. Okay. Uh, because the coronavirus is around. This is uh, two very funny pictures of uh, uh, citizens wearing uh, protective gear. This guy has a very special protection. He should be able to smell his own B.O. This man on the left has a very organic mask. It, uh, it should be able to supply him with vitamin C supplements. And we are still afraid because there's a danger that a second wave might emerge. Just last week, Jia Khan County in China imposed a lockdown. Nobody really knows what's happening, but there's this talk that maybe the virus has re-emerged. And of course, we also know that some people who have been infected can be reinfected. So a lot of unknowns today. With all these unknowns, what does it mean? It means a lot of us will not dare to spend. We will not dare to fly off. So the planes will remain stacked up and parked in the airports. And all the cities, the tourist spots will remain empty. All we are doing all these weeks is basically to flatten the curve. Basically, we don't want people to remain indoors so the number of patients who are caught with this virus will not spike higher than the ability of the country's healthcare system to take care of them. So by staying indoors, we are hoping to flatten the curve so that the country's healthcare system will be able to take care of everyone that's sick. But in the long term, the only solution is herd immunity. What does this mean? Well, viruses have a way of either evolving and they can either evolve into stronger viruses or weaker. In many cases, they become weaker. And, and of course, if many people, so what we are doing is actually buying time by flattening, flattening the curve. If the, the virus evolve into something weaker, then fine, a lot of us are, will be fine. But if it doesn't, then, and there's no vaccination, then what's happened is that a lot of us will be infected. And once we reach about 60, 70%, uh, uh, the numbers tell us that 
the rest will be protected because there'll be enough of us infected and we will develop our own immunity against it. So with no vaccination using herd immunity, then we need 60% of our population to be infected before the rest of us are safe. This is the only way we can do now unless we find the cure, the vaccination. Of course, with the vaccination, if it comes out fast enough, then we can vaccinate a lot of us. And this vaccination is, in fact, it's like uh, coming up with uh, uh, artificial herd immunity. And if that's the case, then the rest of us who are not even vaccinated will be protected. That's the logic of herd immunity. Now, but right now there is no vaccine available. So the global economies are probably going to remain quiet. No one dares to come out. And which means to say the bad news is that the economy might not recover. Well, there are two ways the economy can recover. One is either through a V-shaped recovery, which means suddenly the, the threat disappears and we all come out and start spending again. That will be a V-shape. But in the absence of a vaccine, then what we're probably going to experience is a U-shape. That means a recovery that is going to take a longer time. Well, that means in the next few months, if we can't find a vaccine, um, the rich will, I suppose, isolate themselves, whereas the poor you know, all over the world will have to suffer. The solution is a vaccine, because only a vaccine can change everything around. According to the experts, the earliest that a vaccine can come to us is in sort of 18 months. So that gives us maybe next autumn, autumn 2021. That's a long time away. In the meantime, I'm sure there'll be more damage to the global economy. The trouble is, it's not easy to find a vaccine. Uh, they have not found a vaccine for HIV yet. They have not found a vaccine for SARS yet. Critics of big pharma will say, actually, maybe they know. They know how to create that vaccine, but they don't want to because they want you to keep on buying their medication. Well, that's a cynical view, maybe. Anyway, if there are no vaccines, that means and until autumn of 2021, that means uh, we could be facing the same situation which we did about 100 years ago in 1918. This was the Spanish flu. In that year, 500 million persons got infected. The global population then was 2 billion or 2,000 million uh, people. And out of these 500 million that were affected, 10 to 20% of them died. Today's population is not 2 billion, but let's say 7 billion. So it's three times more. So if the virus is as damaging as the Spanish flu in 1918, that means may not only will uh, 200 million people be affected, 500 million people be affected, but maybe three times more, 1,500 million people will be affected. And out of this, 10 to 20% of us will die. This is a very grim scenario. And I don't want to end on a very sad note. I shall end on an optimistic note. Because there is light at the end of the tunnel. Why do I say that? Because using my econometrics model and looking at long-term economic cycles, I find that actually a turning point is nearby. Let me reload this to show you. We are approaching a turning point in our economic cycle. Okay, why? What can possibly turn the world around, the global economy around? Well, one possibility is that, well, maybe 
someone will come up with a vaccine much earlier than autumn 2021. And if anyone is going to come up with a vaccine, I think it will be the Chinese. Because the Chinese is in a better position to come up with a vaccine. I mean, a few months ago, they could not produce enough face masks for themselves. But now they could make enough for themselves and for the rest of the world. You see, the, the, the getting a vaccine on the market is a laborious process and you have to follow certain principles and protocols. I suppose China could avoid all this or cut short all this. And I wouldn't be surprised if China comes out with a vaccine before the end of this year. There's actually a silver lining in all this disaster that we are experiencing. Two years I mentioned to you that uh, I was expecting a war between China and US, a real war, not just a trade war. And, and it's not just me, a few others have uh, come to this decision based on this Thucydides threat. This is an ancient Greek historian who studied the Peloponnesian War between the Greeks, well, between the Athens, Athenians and the Spartans. What happened was that Spartan was an established rich country and Athens was a new rich country. And a lot of people have used this principle of Thucydides trap and put it on European history. And they found that actually, um, you look back 500 years, uh, this Thucydides trap applies to many phases of European history. The essence of Thucydides trap is that when a rising power rivals a ruling power, a clash will happen. So a lot of people have used this theory to apply to China and USA. That means to say they expect a war to happen. If there's such a war, between US and China, who will win? The truth is, we will all lose. And this is the worst case scenario that can happen. So my silver lining is, sometimes bad things happen to us to mitigate an even worse event. Just like sometimes when we quarrel with our partners, okay, a bigger event, like the death of a child, could bring the two partners together over a shared loss. I see this um, pandemic like as a silver lining, because many people will die, not only in China, but in the US, and the best of the human beings come out in such disaster times. Right now, China is helping the US by supplying them with lots and lots of medical equipment and face masks. This is called Project Average. It just started last week. Hopefully, with this show of help from China, the hawks in the White House would uh, turn away from being hawkish and forget about starting a World War. Amidst all this bad news, what shall we do with our money? Well, um, let me cut this off. Uh, I told you before that I think that uh, a vaccine will come up before the end of the year. And my study of long economic cycles tells me that the uh, global economy will pick up at the end of this year, the turning point, which means to say things will be better at the end of this year. So if you are in the market to buy things, whether it is uh, stocks, property, anything, buy from autumn, because that will be the lowest point in the long-term economic cycle. And from there, things will brighten up. So it's not going to be autumn 2021, but maybe 
autumn this year. So buy from autumn. Autumn would be September, October, November. This uh, concludes my talk. Thank you all of you for your attention. Um, this concludes my talk. And if you feel that you want to donate, please scan the QR code on the left. And if you want uh, access to more of my talks, please scan the QR code on the right. Have a good day.